Thank you guys for showing up. I really appreciate you choosing this one over the other sessions. I know you had choices to make. Thank you so much. Uh, you had a few minutes um, to study my name and the name of my company and the extra long title of my presentation, so I won't waste any more time introducing myself. Um, just maybe a couple of words about my background. I used to be an amateur level designer when I was a kid, spent like four years doing this, and then I got a job as a game developer, and then I started a company. So over the past eight years, I've kind of shaped myself from being a game developer into a kind of person game developers hate, the business guy, serving as a CEO, and you know the things people do for money. So my talk today is somewhere on the overlap of business decisions and game production, and I wanted to talk about the thinking involved when deciding what to do with the game. Do we green light it? Do we kill it off? Do we put more people on the project? Do we downscale it? And sometimes it's easy. When you have a game which is like super awesome in soft launch, I'm talking about free to play games mainly because that's where I work. Your metrics are spot on. You just market the hell out of it, get paid, enjoy a happy life. That's never happened to us. But I heard some people had great results in soft launch. Never happened in my studio. But anyway, theoretically, it should be easy to work with this. Dealing with losers is even easier if the game is obviously bad, like 20% day one retention. Nobody likes it. You just kill it off. Forget about it. Salvage what you can. Learn what you can. Move on. These instances are more frequent than clear winners. But I think the most common scenario is this weird middle ground where your metrics are kind of OK, maybe average, maybe slightly below average. Maybe they excel in some areas, but other areas are bad. The feedback from the audience is kind of mixed. And you are unsure, you are confused. Because you're somewhere in the middle. You're somewhere in this limbo where you're doing something. Your metrics aren't quite there, but the product is improving. You put an effort in, you see the results, but you don't know for sure if finally everything will align perfectly and you'll put missing pieces in and you'll fix all the systems and balance the game and then it's going to explode and everything will be golden. Or if you are, as the slide suggests, polishing a turret and just you know, putting bells and whistles on a game that's fundamentally not marketable. When you are in the middle, you don't know. And it would be really nice if I told you the universal recipe for figuring out the true potential of a game, but there is none, because there's so many variables. In every niche and category and platform, in every given state of the market, there are different parameters. And there are plenty of methodologies for you know, analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of a project. If you are interested in that, there's MBA for you. They'll teach you. One day they'll teach me. But I'm not here to give you MBA bullshit. I'm here to tell a story, a personal so story. So this is story time. Rewind seven years. That's my company. You've seen this image before. I guess it's cliche, but I think it's still accurate. We used to look approximately like those guys. We did not have a clue. We're a small indie outfit, and you know, not in the not the kind of indie outfit which uh, is composed of people with triple-A background trying to express themselves. No, we're just a bunch of guys with no experience whatsoever, uh, except the basic technical skills, trying to make some games for Android. And uh, after struggling for a couple of years, we made this. This game was released in April 2011, and that was the pinnacle of what we learned about the mobile games market at the time. A lot of the things combined to produce a hit. It had quick sessions. It was easy to pick up. It had long-term progression. It had easy controls. It spoke directly to the customer. The, the store page, the title, the screenshots, it was all optimized for discoverability and organic traction. So kind of all the things we experimented with, learned by trying and failing, they all aligned. And we produced a hit. The game took off big time. It was top 10 by downloads across most geos. We've seen 
over 100,000 daily downloads organically. And at some point, we're sitting right next to Angry Birds in the downloads chart. And this is the first significant decision point uh, in our history where we're trying to figure out what do we do now? Because, OK, it's a win, right? We have a game which is getting lots and lots of downloads. It went on to generate about 350 million downloads combined. So it's a pretty big game. We had the success on our hands, but we were not sure what to do with it. Obviously, seeing Angry Birds right next to it made us think briefly about uh, converting it into kind of entertainment property and uh, you know, go in the Flash, Toys, brand building route. But we ruled it out quickly because the game had no identity. And it had a bunch of problems as well. So the revenue per user was quite low. The game was originally designed to be monetized with ads. We retrofitted inner purchases later when the tech arrived. Still, it wasn't quite you know, market leading by that parameter. As I said, had no identity. There were no memorable characters. The gameplay was kind of innovative, but mobile gamers generally don't care that much about what studio invented what kind of gameplay because the, the psychology and the discovery process are completely different. So it's not like you know, BioWare being remembered for their style of you know, delivering choices to the player, or Telltale being remembered for the way they narrate and again present players with choices in their games. So in the mobile market, people generally don't remember who created this. So there was nothing that would protect the game from being copied or just you know, pushed out of the market by a stronger competitor with uh, more quality, better funding, and so on and so forth. So at this point, our decision was to basically abandon this game, which is counterintuitive, but we decided that it's not going to last. So we basically split our business into two directions. One focused on looking for new categories, new games, even new platforms, and trying to reinvent ourselves and find the next winning formula and uh, also you know, grow as a studio. And the other pillar of the business was focused on racing as a category, slowly iterating on this game, uh, coming up with uh, sequels, potentially building maybe a 3D game at some point in the future, maybe a true online 3D game. But then something substantial happened. Next year, this game arrived. You might have seen this one. It's one of the landmark games in mobile game history. It's called CSR Racing. And if you look at the two of them, you might notice similarities. Essentially, in terms of systems and structure, it's the same game. It's beautiful. It's 3D. It's got tight monetization. It was promoted really well. It was presented by an actor wearing the Stig outfit at WWDC, the big Apple event on stage. So it got plenty of marketing help. And it was a great game. It was objectively much better than our product. So even though you know, structurally, as far as game design goes, it's 85% of what we created, they took the throne, basically. And we decided to respond. Naturally, we came up with a vision for a bigger and better game. And that became Nitro Nation. Uh, we launched at some point in 2014 was a good-looking game, still is. Now it's even better-looking, obviously. Had some killer features. Better graphics, better physics. Was conceived as a big racing MMO. We even jokingly refer to it as World of Tanks with Cars, because we wanted to create a game which is like racing on the surface, but beneath it, it's highly social, and it's highly competitive. And there's a lot of depth in the upgrades and the collection elements. So there's like a grand, grand vision behind it. And also a good-looking game. Like if you, if you look at those screenshots from like four years ago, three years ago, they still look OK by current standards. It's a mobile game, by the way. And that was a while back. So it was a difficult project. Had personal departures, had delays, had some quality issues. But then eventually, we reached the global launch. And that's what our revenue looked like after the first few months. Now, I don't have the, the numbers here, because I wanted to keep this clean and you know, give width to the chart. But if you're curious, the bars on the left correspond to roughly 50,000 euros per month. Because some people are like, ah, oh, you're hiding the numbers. There's nothing to hide. There's business and intelligence tools. Everyone can see all the data. What I want to show here is the dynamics. How does this look to you? 
to some people, I guess to most people, it looks okay. Like there's a trend. Our brain is programmed to look for patterns. We see a growth trend here. Soft launch, meh. Android launch, a spike. And then the iOS launch, more money coming in. We're on a good track. Of course, that's not the case here. One alarming sign is the gap between the Android launch and the iOS launch. Each bar is one month. So you might, might, might be asking at this stage already, why the hell did it take you guys like eight, nine months to release the game on arguably the more important platform? What happened there? And then the second alarming sign is lack of growth after the Android launch, because the revenue numbers basically reverted to pre-launch values. And that's not normal, right? Because what's the point of launch then? To get one featuring spot and then revert to where we used to stand? There was no sustainable growth. And the reasons were quite obvious. We didn't have the metrics in place. Our retention for day 30 was close to zero. Almost nobody stuck around. Our LTV, as a result, was way below what we needed for sustainable marketing. We did market the game nonetheless. I mean, we did plenty of clever stuff on social media. We employed some nice guerrilla marketing tricks. Uh, we worked with influencers and na, 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 na. We checked many boxes, but we couldn't do UA as such. We couldn't go to ad networks and buy installs, and we couldn't grow the game by doing that because the metrics were not there. Our ArpDAO average revenue per daily active user was like five cents at the time. And the customer feedback was like, Mixed, to say the least. Some people praised it for being best in class in some areas, like best physics, best upgrades, best graphics. But there were so many problems that the overall experience was kind of, it didn't look like a killer that was about to dominate the category, not even close. But still, there were some positives, even in this dynamic. The game still had some USPs, some selling points that nobody else had. It now had some protection because the technology there was cutting edge. But more importantly, the game was a shadow of the grand design that we had. So it was not a complete product. We managed to get some things right, but huge pieces of functionality were missing. For example, the entire social layer was not there. You couldn't race in real time. You couldn't add friends. There were no teams or clans or guilds, whatever you call it. So if we think about the original vision for a grand big racing MMO, where's the MMO part if you cannot interact with other people in any other way than asynchronous racing and leaderboards? So a lot of big pieces were not there. And we thought, OK, you know, it's difficult. It's slow. The metrics are mediocre at best. But once we complete the grand design, once we put the missing pieces in place, align everything, polish it, We'll have a winner, finally. So we decided to keep pushing. The game was marginally profitable. We felt comfortable. We felt that we can keep grinding and then complete the scope. And then finally, we'll see sustainable growth. Of course, it didn't happen. Instead, we saw a decline and then stabilization at maybe 60% of the peak. And when I'm looking at this chart now, it doesn't look dramatic. It's like, oh, well, there was a decline. So, uh, but every bar, again, was, is one, one month. So approximately 10 months after the iOS launch, we were still not growing. And we had a team of like 20 people working on new features and content and pushing out updates and putting a lot of effort into fixing things. But there was no growth. Why? Well, it was easy to see that there were quality issues. And by quality, I don't mean like bugs. Of course, we had those plenty. We had all sorts of them. We had cars diving under the tarmac and taking off, and we had people getting disconnected randomly and losing races because of that and losing money and, you know, you name it. But m most importantly, the quality was missing in uh, the way the features were delivered. So, for example, at some point we delivered the Teams feature, which was obviously expected by the community and ourselves was supposed to be a big piece of our vision for how retention would be maintained in the game, how we are going to you know, establish the social links between the players. 
And when the, the, the feature shipped, it sucked. It sucked on many levels. Small details, choppy animations, complicated UI, rewards that were not balanced enough. The communication of the value of the teams was not there. So on paper, the team shipped the feature, but the quality was not there. It was like, hey, here's a bunch of buttons. Here's some code. We completed the scope. That's good enough. The atmosphere in the team was really bad. It was obvious the moment you walk in the room. And that was bizarre, because you know, we, we used to be such an energetic company, you know, a bunch of underdogs delivering the game previously that raced the top of the charts, got hundreds of millions of downloads. And there was still energy at the upper floor, you know, in the ivory tower across the, you know, the management guys. We were super enthusiastic, we had great plans, we had the vision, we had the, the optimism, we had the money. But if you set foot in the team's space, you would see some kind of indifference and fatalistic attitude. The people were not ignited for some reason. But there was still lots of good stuff on the roadmap, and there was still this promise of finally fixing things and then finally pushing the last pieces of functionality and then completing the scope and having this grand game and finally dominating the market. But we decided that we've had enough because we've been in the cycle for many months where, okay, we shipped an update. It's not amazing, but there's another update coming, and that one for sure will fix things. And then that update comes, and it's still you know, great in some areas, breaks other things. This time we decided, okay, we should change something. And the obvious action at this point would be to just kill the game, right? Shut down the project, reassign people, maybe lay some people off. But when we started looking at the entire funnel, and I, I'll explain if I have the time why I call it a funnel, we realized that the metrics of the game and the quality issues of the product are mere, merely evidence of problems higher up the chain. Because when you think about bugs, for example, your natural reaction is to blame QA. Because QA guys, you know, the, 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 the job description says they are supposed to be testing the games and making sure that, you know, the quality is maintained. So if the game is buggy, then you have to blame the QA guys. But what if the QA guys are simply overwhelmed and there's just too many bugs and they are reporting everything religiously, but the quality of the product that they are receiving from the developers is so low, it's just not possible to fix everything and we still need to ship someday. So now the developers are to blame because they are delivering code that's not working as expected. But then as we move further up the chain, we see that you know, the game designer guys, they are not documenting the features clearly enough. There's a lot of gray areas and ambiguity, and that's why the developers are unable to execute on the vision, because they don't have clear directions. They don't have the necessary tools to clarify the ambiguity. And then as a result, the features they ship, they don't work as expected by the game designers. And when we, at this point, we are inclined to blame the game designers, but then shouldn't it be the producer whose sole responsibility is to make sure that you know, everything is working like a well-oiled machine? So maybe the producer is to blame. But then if you move even further up the chain, somebody hired the guy, right? Somebody hired the producer and kept, kept him at the helm for a couple of years. So maybe I am to blame. And while analyzing all this and trying to dig deep into the root of the problems, we found that it's not the game that is the problem. We have issues all across the board, culturally and in terms of how people communicate. And uh, it's a big mess. So the game in this example is merely a reflection of our struggles as a business. We grew fast. We went from five people to 80 people in the space of two, two and a half years. That's way too fast by any standard. But more importantly, we didn't have the right kind of process in place to ensure this was as smooth as possible. And we basically lost our identity. We hired people from non-gaming companies because we needed to plug the holes. We did not really check the values of the people we hired. We did not proactively communicate our values. We didn't work with those people to make sure they fit into our culture that they begin to advocate this culture. And basically, we created this disconnect between the guys at the top being super excited and energetic and optimistic and just, you know, 
waiting for the rest of the company to catch up and the rest of the company creating their own values and their own assumptions and their own protocols for communication. We spread ourselves too thin. We lost our DNA. We lost our identity. We had no culture. So we had to work on that first. And we had to develop a big, a massive, in scope, set of measures we had to implement to fix things in the company first. And then killing the project would not replace it. But we still needed to do something with the project. We still needed to decide if we keep it or not, if we you know, downscale it, offload it to another company, shut it down for good, or keep pushing. And at this point, the considerations we had were the value that the team was creating, even when the, the product was not performing, and availability of alternatives. And we found that we did not have any other alternatives in the company. So we didn't have any exciting new games coming up where we would put those people. Uh, we didn't have any prototypes emerging that could accommodate that many people. We could have laid them off, but that was kind of pointless because, you know, in terms of professional competence, most of them were really good guys. We just did not have the right kind of environment and the right kind of atmosphere to make them efficient. So we decided to keep the game. The changes we implemented over the years were global. They touched every corner of the company. We started paying way more attention to our HR. We gave HR guys more leverage, more tools to make an impact. We started developing a more inclusive culture where we would proactively communicate our values, would proactively uh, communicate our goals, be very open about revenue. Previously, we kind of avoided it because, you know, conventional wisdom, wisdom says that you don't want to, you know, show your finance to your employees. But uh, we found that there's no other way around because ultimately we have nothing to hide, really. We shouldn't be ashamed of making money because we need to make money to deliver new games, right? We need to make money to deliver new content to the players and to delight them. If we're not making money, then we're not able to do this. And there is no trade off. It's natural. So we started being more open about what we needed to achieve financially. We started being more inclusive in our business conversations. We started communicating a lot more, both vertically and horizontally. Vertically, we implemented uh, more meetings and seminars. And uh, I started doing a blog, for example. For the past couple of years, I've been doing a video blog every month where I talk about every game and how they're performing and why they had a bad month or a good month. Horizontally, we uh, created uh, platforms for people from different teams to talk to each other. We also moved to a new office, which was on the same floor. Previously, it was spread over four floors. And we, at that point, thought that's a good idea because you know, people will walk, move a bit. People obviously didn't walk because everyone gravitates towards you know, their own bubble. And when there are physical walls around you and staircases separating the levels, it's way easier to create your bubble. So that led to isolation. And one of the changes we made was moving to an office which is on the same floor, glass walls, bright, cozy, kind of reinforcing the message of transparency that we were trying to propagate internally. Another small touch which might appear insignificant was the change from Skype to Slack for team communication. And I don't want to say that Slack is the best tool for teams, there are viable alternatives, but Skype sucked. So we had to do this. My personal opinion is Skype still sucks. And I'm Estonian. I'm, I mean, Skype was invented in Estonia, so I accept full responsibility for this. It still sucks. But I'm not here to start a holy war. Uh, what I found interesting was when we forced a transition to Slack, people started creating closed groups for no reason. Because in, in Skype, they used to have group chats. And group chats are closed by definition. You cannot just enter someone's group chat. You have to be invited. And they started replicating the same behavior in Swag. And Swag is based on channels. And channels are kind of the default mode. And groups are, you know, or locked channels. They are secondary. And then I started asking people, like, so you have this game design channel for a given game. And you locked it. Why did you lock it? And they were like, oh, well. This is our game design chat. It's, it's not interesting to anyone. Well, it's, if it's not interesting to anyone, then people will just not join. And if it's interesting to a programmer working on the game, then you know, this is the holy grail. You have a programmer who is interested in 
seeing the bigger picture and at least you know informing himself or herself about the you know the, the game design vision that's why that's the kind of people we really want to have in our company because they understand the business goals they understand the you know the design like the vision for the game and not just their small stretch of the road and uh, that was that kind of exemplified the culture we had and the kind of culture we needed to have because you cannot really claim to be inclusive and transparent and on the same page when people are automatically you know erecting walls where they don't need to have anything on the team level we also needed to implement changes we cannot, couldn't just continue as we were obviously there, there was a new guy in charge uh, this time we were more thorough i spent eight months looking for a replacement and of course there were differences between the you know the previous producer and the new producer i'm not trying to say that the new guy was more competent or you know more pleasant to work with or more aspirational he was a better fit right he liked cars the previous guy didn't like cars he used to drive some kind of kia which was about the size of this thing and he i mean that's not a problem it's practical right but you can drive a kia or a bicycle but you can still be passionate about drag racing or drifting or formula one or whatever or you know if you are not inherently passionate about this if you're in charge of 20, 30 people developing the game about cars, you can educate yourself to be, you know, an expert in this field. And that just didn't happen. And uh, he just didn't have, you know, the, the kind of drive to excel. So he wasn't, he was really competent, but he did not excel. And slowly, the, all the key people in the team became similar. So they were guys who were really competent, had good resumes, but they were not really passionate about cars. And I think the sentiment was, Okay, so this game is not going anywhere, and eventually it's getting shut down, so we might as well wait it out until there's a new project which is more interesting, and then you know we can finally make a game we've been all waiting for. A new person had to come in and basically reset the leadership and put new people in charge and uh, get excited about cars and get excited about what players are excited about. We also started being more transparent on team level. For example, we came up with a dashboard which shows sales and ArpDAO and daily active users in real time, and anyone can access it if they were so inclined. At some point, we had it on the, on the big screen in, in the room. I think it's gone by, by now, but it served its purpose. So we started, stopped hiding uh, the numbers. We stopped passively providing the numbers. We started proactively showing the numbers, like, hey, guys, this is how your game is doing right now compared to yesterday, day before yesterday, last year, any stretch you need to look at, this is where you stand. This is where you can go from here. We also started setting more clear goals, financial and expressed in metrics, like what kind of retention we're aiming for, why is that important, how is retention factored into LTV, why is LTV important, uh, why is LTV the key to unlocking UA, why is UA important, why is revenue important. So we started explaining those things proactively and being more inclusive and not just, you know, keeping the business conversation between the business guys. We also work hard to establish new teams for everything that's necessary, but not related directly to development, like UA, social media management, uh, guys working in app store optimization. Hire new people, gave them more freedom. If you attended the excellent talk by uh, Small Giant Games earlier, it was said that in their organization, UA does what UA needs to do. Those guys are on track to spend 80 million on marketing this year. And, you know, giving the UA guys the leverage and the latitude to work as they see fit is the only way to, you know, be efficient. Because they have their own tools, they have their own mindset, you have to support it and not try to, you know, entangle them with the production team's vision or, you know, the, the branding stuff. The, you have to give them freedom because, you know, UA is hard enough as it is. So, they, they, and this applies to many, many areas. You have to give people maximum freedom unless there's a good reason to restrict it. And if you restrict it somehow, it has to be well documented and formalized. And finally, we, we decided to do a big 
major update for the game because we needed the psychological reset. We did not necessarily need to have a big update. We didn't necessarily need to bundle lots of features into one release. But we thought that we needed this kind of milestone where we say, okay, so this is the line after which will be a new team with a new product. Even though technically it's still the same game, but we need this kind of psychological reboot. And this is what happened revenue-wise. Not amazing. Over the next five months, revenue declined almost 50%. So the last peak here is April 16th. It's where I told the producer who was previously running the game that he needs to go. And that was a high point for a while. And then it was just downhill from there. And that was pretty bad. But that was okay because the many things I listed previously, we could not possibly do them overnight. In an organization which is 100 people or more, you cannot just issue a decree and say, hey guys, now we do things this way. Any change is always met with resistance. Even if it's objectively positive, even if it's moving from like ancient, slow, awkward messenger to a fast you know, messenger with emojis and stickers, there's, there's gonna be tons of resistance. You cannot just say, okay guys, now, now this is the new company and this is how we do things. In an organization of this size, every change has to be slow and gradual. You have to consistently make small steps and then you have to be patient and see the program through and then reap the rewards. So during those five months, of course we were a bit upset because you know, we're losing money, we're dying, it's bad. It's my money, I'm the major shareholder, it sucks. But uh, this had to be done. And of course, that's a sort of happy ending because that's how it looks now. And the, the last bar is September, the month that just ended. And obviously, you know, in September, it was just me, uh, you know, spending some money in game because I was going to do this presentation. I wanted this to look nice. Of course not. But uh, what can we see here? Well, consistency. So there was a turning point. Of course, I selected. Uh, you know, September for the previous slide deliberately because that was like the low point. Then we launched this big update and then gradually things started improving. So we gradually saw better quality throughout. Uh, we saw people take more responsibility slowly, you know, one by one. We gradually removed the, the bureaucratic loops we used to have, for example, Eventually, we moved from a situation where a game designer would seek approval from a producer to design a feature, and then he would hand the feature off to the project manager, and then the project manager would chop it into tasks and give those tasks to artists and programmers and you know, oversee them. Ultimately, we removed the project manager. So now, the way things work, if a game designer wants to do something, he pitches it to an artist and a, and a, and a programmer. They come up with a, you know, some kind of prototype or just short pitch. Go to the producer, the producer is like, mm -hmm. if it's mm, they just execute it. So it's way easier. Of course, you know, you cannot just flip a switch and have the entire organization work this way because it calls for, you know, a sense of responsibility and ownership, which takes months, if not years, to develop. But eventually we got there. So gradually, step by step, slowly accelerating things, you know, reinforcing every moment when someone in the team took responsibility when things were done more efficiently and less, you know, formally. We managed to be way more predictable with our features and updates. And when you're more predictable with the schedule, it makes everyone's life way easier. It makes life easier for UA guys. It makes it easier for the BD guys because it's easy to secure, you know, promos from the platforms. It's easy to arrange something interesting with partners. And the extra layer of complexity with this game is that we license the cars from, from the brand owners. And now it's like 39 of them. So we always need to align the timing. You know. If we want to be clever with our live ops, we need to have some kind of predictability and consistency in our schedule. And gradually we got there, and that just made life way easier for everyone. So in the end, by doing lots of different visibly disconnected things, we had small improvements everywhere. And then the compound benefit was this, the, the, the slow but steady and predictable growth. So is this a happy ending? Well, not really, because 
If you look at the racing games category, if you, for example, go to Google Play, open the US store, look at the charts, you won't see Night of Nation at number one. That spot is occupied by CSR Racing 2, which is a great product backed by great infrastructure and great UA. You'll find us at number five or six. If you go to the App Store, you might find us at number 10, 11, 12. So we did not quite live up to the expectation of dominating the niche. And it's unlikely that this game is getting there at this pace. Because lost time is lost time. We learned a lot, that is true. We matured a lot as an organization. And coming from a game in decline and a game that was you know, depressed, um, falling apart, and making this turnaround and setting yourself on a growth trajectory which is predictable and manageable, that's valuable, but ultimately we lost at least a year. And a year in the life of a project is a year multiplied by the size of the team. So if the team is 20 people, that's 20 years of professional lives essentially lost. And that's on me, ultimately. So it's not a happy ending. But this allowed us to complete something that we needed to complete anyway. Because in the early stages of our development, we kind of skipped a big part of the book. We did not form a startup after working in a major company for 10 years. We did not come from digital chocolate, you know. We did not have a chance to see how things are done. We did not have a chance to study from anyone. We did not see the failures of other people. We just jumped straight in, struggled for a year, completely disconnected from the industry. And then we grew really fast. That's what happened. But this stretch of education, the, 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 the stretch of maturing as a company and as leadership that needed to be done. And we joke internally that we completed the most expensive educational course, you can imagine, but we still needed to do this. Now, some key takeaways. I think it's been pretty obvious by now, but um, we've seen firsthand that sometimes if you look at the benchmarks and, and you look at your game metrics, for example, it might be perfectly obvious that you need to kill this game because it's no good, so why are you developing this? But sometimes it's a reflection of problems on another level. And if you don't fix that, you just bring, start a new project, for example, it's going to produce the same result. If you bring new people in, those new people will become the same as the old team because the environment over years dictates what kind of people you are, what kind of projects you create, what kind of mistakes you make. Positive change is only possible if it's consistent and if the steps are small. Don't get me wrong, it's not like we you know, looked at the results after two years of working on the game and then we're like, okay guys, let's fix something. It was immediately obvious that there were problems. We sensed the problems early on and there were many points when you know, I, I went to the team floor and I sat with the team and you know, leading by example, you know, fixing the bugs. But that's like, that's like doing homework with the kids, you know. You cannot do this forever. You have to teach them how to be independent. And the same applies to team management. So we needed to be really patient and we needed to come up with a nice plan which stretches multiple years and involves multiple uh, parties within the organization and slowly and steadily execute on it. And that's how we managed to achieve change. I think this methodology traces back to the Japanese manufacturers. I think the car makers in particular because they kind of came up with this concept of slow but steady uh, iterations that ultimately result in huge changes in company in corporate culture. If I'm not mistaken, during the, the, the period of time when Toyota went from being like cheap Asian cars to being the, the most reliable cars in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Of course, key people are important. This whole transformation would not be possible from uh, if we had not brought new people on board. So the, the, the shape of the company, the image of Creative Mobile as it is now, vibrant, energetic, brave, confident, it's shaped by maybe seven to ten people, ultimately. The most proactive, the most impactful, the most passionate and committed. And it's an organization which is now 130 people and growing. 
but the DNA is from just a handful of guys. Handful of guys. And similarly, the negative changes that we experienced earlier in our history, they were driven by people. Not consciously, of course, it's not like anyone was sabotaging, but you know, just by not being passionate enough, not giving that extra 10% on top of the 100, we allowed serious problems to develop. And then finally, transparency and autonomy are really hard to execute on team level, on corporate level, but they were absolutely instrumental because once we became more transparent, more honest, more proactively transparent and honest and gave people more freedom, we slowly started seeing the results of that labor and started seeing more efficiency in the way features were being shipped and you know, designed. And months and years later, that was reflected in the revenue statement as well. So to wrap it up, you know, we've completed a very expensive educational course. And that's kind of OK, because we've improved dramatically. We matured as a company. And every year, we're much better than the previous year. And that's, I th that, I think, is OK for an organization at a specific stage in its development, as long as it's not dead. And I'm here with you today, so we're not dead yet. That's, that's a weird sound. And that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'm really passionate about the subject. I used to be a developer once until I started the company. Uh, I'll be around. You can ask questions right now or later. Uh, this is the first time I'm giving this presentation. It's a bit personal, so I'm not sure if it's any good. Please feel free to give feedback, review it on the app. You can do this anonymously. That'll be much appreciated because I genuinely try to you know, be useful here, right? So that's it. Thank you very much for staying with me. Oh, we have questions, possibly. Thank you for the very honest and insightful talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? Just raise a hand. We have microphones to hand out. Hi. I'm just wondering, uh, regarding the last point, um, you really didn't elaborate in terms of any specifics, especially about transparency and autonomy which are two quite separate subjects. Um, yeah, that's true. Could you uh, maybe uh, particularly on uh, maybe transparency uh, comment? Or like, let's say elaborate, like let's say what were some failures versus some successes of transparency in the company? Well, the biggest failure was assuming that if we are, if we as you know, co-founders and the upper management are honest and transparent by nature, which I believe we are and there is evidence that we are, our assumption was that it's going to propagate to the rest of the company as we grow. Because you know, originally it was just like 10 guys in the, same group, in the same room. And we all shared the same values. And when things didn't work, everybody knew they're not working. When we had a nice um, day of sales, you know, everybody would you know, party together and were completely open about everything. And then as we grew, we kind of assumed that because we are you know, growing consecutively, our values will spread and you know, people will automatically assume that as long as we are not hiding anything or screwing them over, that we are you know, transparent and honest. But what actually happened was people not asking the questions, essentially. I had, I had this um, bizarre example of one of my senior managers leaving for another company, a major company, like 10 times the size of us. So that's OK. Uh, but uh, I asked him for a sort of an exit review of our work together. And uh, he said that shutting down one of the games that we shut down previously was madness, that we should not have done it by any measure, and that basically contributed to the, to the downfall of the company, and that's why he was leaving, among other things. Now, the interesting part here is that there was overwhelming evidence that this game needed to be shut down. It wasn't subjective. Like, the metrics were shit, and nobody wanted to work on it. I mean, when you have a game which is absolutely disastrous in terms of how much money it's making on a per-user basis and the revenues are meh, and there's not a single person on your team who is you know, interested in developing it, then you probably need to shut it down. And that data was there, and he was senior enough to access that data directly without even asking me. But in the worst case scenario, he could have, could have said, hey, Vlad, why did you guys shut down this game? And he went on for two years, not ask, asking the question. And that's why I mean by transparency. Like, specifically proactive transparency. That is, that is my failure in this case, because I needed to explain the decision to everyone. I needed to, I don't know, write an article, assemble a meeting, maybe a team meeting, and say, hey guys, we did this because of that. Because if you don't, don't do this, 
then people will assume whatever is more comfortable and they will listen to whoever is the loudest. And the loudest guy can be, you know, a QA guy in the smoking room. Speaking about, you know, the multiple reasons why this world is heading towards an ecological disaster, our country is ruled by idiots, and among other things, this specific company is also being run by idiots. And that, repeated day after day, becomes, you know, the, the opinion. So you have to counteract this. However, you know, honest and transparent you are in truth as a leader, you have to propagate those ideas. So that's why I mean when I say I've, I've started doing a video blog, which sounds a bit ridiculous, because you know, I run a company with 130 people in it. I'm not a YouTube guy, right? That's not my job. But uh, it's been a huge success. And it's really simple. I just talk about each of the games. And I, I'm like, OK, so we had this RDAO and this number of downloads and this retention metrics this month because you know this game got featured. Could have been better if they didn't break it with that. But OK, this is what it is. And I have a rating and everything. And that's been hugely successful. Like people are, even two years after I started this, I have people say during one-on-ones that this is great, which is absolutely you know, illogical. I've been doing this for two years. We've just run a new round of one-on-ones in these specific teams. And, and, and the HR guy said, like two people said that those videos are great. I'm like, wow, good. It's been two years. So, so that's what I mean there. And regarding the autonomy, I'm talking specifically about you know, uh, situations where, as I said, a game designer has an idea for a feature. He pitches it to a programmer guy and then an artist guy, and they come up with some kind of vision for it, and they just get an approval and then get it done. So that's autonomy. But that autonomy is really hard because you have to have people actually coming up with meaningful ideas. They, uh, they need to understand the customer, they need to read the reviews, they need to go to the forums and see what people actually think. They need to have a sense of responsibility and ownership and understand the, the, the not so obvious connection between them doing something nice, uh, efficiently, and delighting the customer now, and everyone being in a better place a few years down the road. So that's the hard part. Just telling people that, okay, you can create features and ship them on your, on your own, that's not hard. The hard part is creating the context that makes them, you know, make the right calls at the right time. You're talking about giving them the uh, proper direction that should be aligned with the company? Proper direction is very vague, because obviously, you know, what is proper direction? I, I cannot give proper direction to the product team, right? And the producers sometimes cannot do this. So what we ended up having is people actually, you know, talking to the players in the end of Facebook and going to Facebook groups and reading the feedback and playing the goddamn game. And then coming up with stuff that makes sense. And it's kind of, you know, it sounds a bit like a pipe dream. Because how can you possibly play your own game after four years? How can you possibly go to the same Facebook group and, you know, read through all the garbage that people post? All, all, and, you know, all the negativity. But there's no other way to do it, because if you are expecting someone else to digest it and then give you the right kind of idea to implement, then ultimately that guy becomes the, you know, the, the guy in charge of the game. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Vlad, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>